uh, Kivit, Acting DG, Dr. Ramahopa uh, from ESA, and all the people that are part of the portfolio committee today, good morning. We have convened uh, this meeting as the portfolio committee because, oh, before that, Ms. Martini said, do we have any apologies other ah, than the one that I've received of the minister? Yes, Jefferson, um, good morning to yourself, honorable members and my colleagues. First apology is that in case you hear background noise, I'm currently driving chair, I'm posted in KZN uh, with the Aircom, the Joint Committee on Flood Disaster Relief and Recovery. But I'll be at the meeting. So in case I, I uh, come in and out of the meeting, I will really apologize in advance. The other apologies that we have um, is Honorable Fan Skalbeck, who will be lending at 10 o'clock. So she'll only join the meeting thereafter. Honorable Van Staden is attending another committee meeting today. Uh, Honorable Van Tebula is also writing exams. He won't be able to join. Um, the Minister of, the, of Public Works is also unable to join because she's attending a cabinet meeting. Uh, the DG as well um, is not able to attend the meeting. We've, we also have an apology of our researcher, uh, Ms. Inez Stephanie, but I see she's just logged in and the committee assistant of, of this portfolio uh, who has a bereavement is also unable to join in Jefferson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Martinez. Um, My apologies. Recording uh, in progress. So, so oh, no, I've noted yours. Uh, uh, oh, that thank, you, thank you so much. Seven. So it means you will have to leave the meeting uh, at some time uh, so that you can board the flight. Um, thank you. Um, honorable members, uh, GM, um, and, and, and the team from Public Works and Infrastructure, and, and ISA, um, we have convened this meeting, uh, if I may read what uh, we have requested from you. Stay away, you. Maybe it's network. Honorable members. Oh, you are back. I lost you. Yes. God, I wonder what is the problem. <sighs> Uh, as I was saying, um, we have requested a progress report on the review of the National Infrastructure Management Strategy and the report on the recent training of Infrastructure South Africa in the five case model and project development route map. That's what we have requested from the department. The reason we are doing this, um, uh, DM, and 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 uh, the, the um, and your team from uh, the department is that as the committee we are in, we are concerned about improving service delivery, and again we have a serious concern when it comes to the task of providing office space, courts, police stations, prison, and social infrastructure, which is at the heart of service delivery. And having infrastructure, South Africa, that is why we want a progress report uh, because of, of, of those issues. And we know that infrastructure, South Africa, is the driver uh, on all the major infrastructure projects in our country. So we really want to know. And again, lastly, um, we, as the committee, we have resolved to hear. In fact, it's something that we have said several times that we want to understand your program on the routine maintenance, not maintenance that is going to be done because we are reacting on something that has happened. And we believe that the national infrastructure management strategy will assist in improving service delivery. With those words, I wanted to outline why we requested you and the reports that you are going to be presenting to us today. 
With those few words, I welcome you all in the meeting. Um, and also all those that are watching our, our meeting who are not part of the committee, but are watching our meeting, we welcome you all. Um, DM, over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and a very good morning to your good self, to the honorable members of the committee and the support team of the committee, to the support from the department as led this morning by Professor Ramukhupa, as well as uh, his support team. Uh, let me greet everyone, uh, even those watching YouTube, and parliamentary channel, let me greet everyone a good uh, morning. And let me first start by appreciating this opportunity, uh, Honorable Chairperson, to brief not only the committee, but uh, the country, uh, South Africa, on our strategy and our uh, plan. Um, as you correctly indicate, uh, that you would, as members of parliament, understand the infrastructure space uh, that we are operating in. And also uh, you would want to assure the country that actually uh, South Africa is hard at work in realizing its uh, objectives as stated in, uh, the, by the president uh, in SONA. Uh, let me or, or remind the honorable members that in SONA, that is the state of the nation address uh, in 2020, President uh, Ramaphosa um, kind of gave a directive and an instruction to, this, to the country to say, move away from consumptive uh, expenditure and look at uh, productive uh, activities and redirected our focus on uh, productive activities to infrastructure uh, development and uh, infrastructure spending. Uh, so we, we are hard at work as a department um, since he also redirected the department from just being a public works department to a, also an infrastructure, uh, to have an infrastructure focus um, as a department. And, and therefore we started off with um, ensuring that we work on, on, this, on the infrastructure uh, plan for the next uh, the 30 years, which is um, the infrastructure 2050. Um, and with, with that uh, in, in mind, yes, we did have in the past what you would uh, refer to as uh, NIMS, which uh, the chair has uh, adequately uh, referred to. But I think the focus that the president was directing us to was out of realizing that um, the programs that have been there uh, on uh, infrastructure development have not really yielded the desired uh, outcomes. Um, and, and therefore he was kind of saying, it can't be business as usual. Um, I can safely say, we didn't have an infrastructure plan uh, in the past. Uh, we didn't have a pipeline infrastructure and skills pipeline in the past. Um, we didn't have um, a private sector involvement in the development of uh, both public and uh, uh, infrastructure, as well as um, the systems that were there were more um, controlled by the public through the public funds, which is through treasury. And now we we have a we, we have had to refocus, and we have had to re um, 
uh, configure how we do um, our work and, and therefore had to reintroduce new methodologies. And, and hence we now uh, talk of the South, South Africa's uh, infrastructure investment plan. We now talk of a, 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 such a plan being um, targeted in terms of implementation, having a focus on short, medium and long-term uh, 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 approaches as well as, um, again, looking at um, putting the construction industry, which we all agree was, was kind of um, going in a negative um, way, um, going down. And now we, we, we have had to have the strategy on in terms of how we, put it back uh, to work, uh, creating the so much needed employment opportunities. And, and therefore we couldn't continue with the business as usual approach. We needed a, a different approach. But on the platform, uh, I do have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Ramukhuba who has um, worked with uh, Nkosana and team uh, in, 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 in the department, as well as I also have um, uh, Dr. Muemi, who's the acting DG. Um, and between um, acting DG and Professor Ramakhupa, which I think it will be Professor Ramakhupa who will lead uh, the, the, the presentation this morning. Um, of course, working together with uh, Alec and Tim, uh, they will pr present and uh, we will take uh, questions uh, and comments thereafter, Chair. But let me once again appreciate this opportunity that you've given us. And I hand over to Professor Ramakupa. Uh, uh, he comes in. Um, uh, DM, apologies, uh, members and, and DM and, and all those that are in the meeting. I have a serious challenge of network, so I will I will try to not to open my video. Um, I indicated that um, uh, through the apologies that uh, the acting DG is not part of the meeting, and as such, I didn't acknowledge him, and I've been made uh, aware that he's part of the meeting. So we formally acknowledge the acting uh, DG, Mr. Muomi, who is part of the meeting. And also congratulations, I'm still saying Dr. Ramakopa, that now he is professor. Congratulations, uh, professor. We will no longer say now Dr. Ramakopa. So with us as the head of ISA, we have Professor Ramakopa. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, and uh, thank you very much for the congratulatory remarks, and thank you very much to, to the DM for providing the context. Uh, good morning to Honorable Members, colleagues, and, uh, and people who are watching uh, online. Uh, the DG has asked that uh, I, 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 I lead this part of the presentation. As indicated, the DG, Dr. Muemi, has, uh, has joined us. Uh, Honourable uh, Chair and, uh, and, and members, I think the, the, the Deputy Minister has succeeded in uh, providing a very rich political context. I think uh, it's important just to have a, a broader appreciation of, um, if you like, the location of uh, infrastructure in the, in the recovery effort uh, of the country. The, the President did uh, introduce the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan as part of our overall response to the devastation of the pandemic. And one of the, of the major drivers of uh, the ERRP, as the president puts it, the infrastructure is a flywheel for, for recovery and, uh, and transformation. So in an attempt, uh, uh, honorable chain members to respond to the questions posed by the committee, we, we have segmented the presentation uh, in two parts. The first one, we will uh, reflect on the national infrastructure maintenance strategy. And I think the key here is a point that uh, both the chair and the, and the DM have mentioned in that uh, 
uh, this, uh, the, the existing infrastructure is, uh, is uh, facing significant neglect and as a result of that is crumbling. And we know that uh, the replacement cost is exponentially higher than the maintenance cost. So it's important that we, we introduce and maintain some degree of discipline in how we protect and preserve our assets. We are able to, to elongate uh, their, their useful life uh, so that we were able to reprioritize uh, a money um, in state of replacement, replacing existing assets, but we are able to um, attend to other pressing uh, priorities in the country. And the Honorable Chair, the, the, and that part will be led by D, D, uh, DDG, uh, 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 Mr. Kubeka. And then the second part, uh, Chair and the Honorable Ministers, is, uh, is just to share with the committee just the reconfiguration of uh, the infra public sector infrastructure ecosystem. There's uh, an introduction of uh, a, a method to evaluate and appraise project. And this is uh, an internationally recognized uh, uh, approach on how you do project preparation appraisal. Uh, it's called the five case model. It's, uh, it's used by the G20 countries. It is useful that we were able to uh, embrace uh, uh, the kind of uh, method that is uh, recognized globally because it makes it easier for us to access the big pool of um, liquidity that is available uh, both domestically and internationally and for international investors uh, and um, institutional uh, uh, investors. Uh, they really want to have uh, comfort that the methods that you are applying are, are methods that they, they are familiar with. So when we have conversations with the uh, the potential in, uh, international uh, uh, financiers on uh, our infrastructure uh, uh, project plan. The conversation is not about the um, the, the accuracy and robustness of the, of the method, but uh, essentially it's about the quality of the projects that were put in before them. So we will share with the with the committee how we, we are reconfiguring that space. Of course, there's a lot of it that is still remains to be. Uh, resolved with the, the the many players in the space, in particular National Treasury, but we have been holding, if you like, uh, uh, fortnightly the discussions with National Treasury led by our ministers, uh, Minister Dilil, uh, Minister Godongwane, and the Minister in the Presidency, just to ensure that we are able to to reconcile the the infrastructure ecosystem and uh, we were able to live up to the expectation of creating a, a single pipeline of um, of projects in the country and i think the the emerging consensus there is that the uh, isa must play that role as envisaged in the in the infrastructure plan that the minister and dm did present and was uh, was adopted by by cabinet uh, going forward so again uh, with uh, your permission chair uh, just on the uh, subject expect matters here um, with your permission Kosana will lead the, the first part and the, and the Ms. Masemola will then lead, uh, uh, lead the second part and they uh, will make ourselves available chair and committee to, to respond to questions as a collective led by, by Dr. Mwen. Uh, thanks uh, chair with uh, your permission uh, Kosana I'm sure will be able to lead us. Thanks. Um. Good, good, good morning, uh, Chair, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, um, the Deputy Minister, the Acting DG and Prof. Ramakupa, the Head of ISA, and uh, all the colleagues on the platform. Chair, with your permission, um, if you could allow me to switch on the video, um, there's um, load shedding in around where I am and so that I increase the network connectivity. Um, honorable members, I'm not sure who's going to be presenting, but the secretary is going to fly to the presentation. Only Anne. Can they give you the, the hosting rights so that you don't have a challenge, you just show us? If I may request the chat to share, because I'm, I have a challenge with my network and the laptop in terms of the the sharing. So if I can allow the end to just share for me, please. While uh, 
No, Lord, can you give Leanne the hosting rights? Is Leanne in the meeting? Yes, Chairperson, uh, she, she is in the meeting. Okay. So, so whilst, uh, whilst uh, um, uh, uh, Leanne is sharing, uh, honorable members, um, we, 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 the, the aim of the presentation as the Deputy Minister and Prof have indicated, we, we, we want to paint a picture of uh, where the journey started in terms of uh, the adoption of NIMS as the strategy for managing infrastructure in the country uh, to where, um, if, if you can go to slide number three, introduction, yes. So, so we want to paint a picture in terms of the journey of where NIMS uh, started in, in 2006 and when it was launched in May of 2008, but also the journey towards how uh, the movement from NIMS to the National Immovable uh, Asset Management Framework, which uh, was a component of NIMS, and how that then uh, led to National Treasury uh, developing uh, and come up with what is known as the Framework for Infrastructure Delivery Management, Procurement Management, which is FITPIM, and how the alignment on what uh, Prof raised on the, the bankability and the feasibility of major projects as part of portfolio management and also as part of project management as some of the processes that are outlined in the feed PIM. So, so when, when NIMS was then um, uh, approved, um, uh, the key focus areas was around one, strengthening the regulatory uh, framework, right from uh, planning, budgeting of the, and well as the maintenance of the public uh, infrastructure assets, assisting uh, various institutions that deals with infrastructure with non-financial resources in respect of the maintenance of public uh, infrastructure assets and thirdly developing a maintenance industry because the country at the time realized that there's a need to develop uh, the maintenance industry so that you have a maintenance corps and maintenance capabilities within the sector to be able to assist government and the state in maintaining the infrastructure. And the fourth uh, key area was around how we're gonna strengthen monitoring evaluation and reporting of maintenance uh, of public infrastructure uh, so that we have a, a continuous uh, improvement in terms of the infrastructure. So the, the Department of Public Works uh, at the time was then uh, tasked to lead the implementation of NIMS supported by the uh, CIDB, uh, who was then to provide an overall uh, program management of the, the, the rollout uh, of, the, of, of NIMS. Uh, next slide, please. So, so there was a realization in terms of the problem statement that all uh, spheres of government as well as SOEs that are, they have a major portfolio of assets that they are managing. And there was a strong evidence at the time that uh, if you look at uh, the infrastructure pre and post 1994, there was a poorly maintenance of the infrastructure. And, and some of the key challenges that uh, undermine uh, the maintenance uh, included at the time, the, the register of uh, uh, immovable assets were, were, was incomplete and in some instances non-existent but we have moved uh, in terms of uh, where we are now with the uh, movable asset register of the state. The focus was on providing new services and, and very little on maintenance. And even on those new services, because if you look at the life cycle asset management, as you start to plan for an asset, you need to infuse how you're gonna be maintaining it from day one. Like for an example, if you look at the, 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 in the car industry, when you buy a new motor vehicle, it, it comes automatically with a maintenance plan. So, so what, what has been happening here is that 
the state focus on new service delivery in terms of new infrastructure, but uh, there was very little on the, on the, the maintenance um, uh, in terms of the planning. So, so all public entities um, uh, did not have an asset management plan because every asset, it should have a management a maintenance plan uh, where you are looking at uh, some of the critical components which come with the operations manual. So you need then to follow maintenance as dictated by uh, uh, manuals. And some of the maintenance are scheduled, uh, they are periodical, uh, so as dictated by those uh, manuals. So, so most of the assets then did not have such uh, plans. Um, and, 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 and also there were very um, um, uh, limited uh, budgets uh, to, to, to often conduct the maintenance. And, and some of the budgets were, were not even ring fence. And, and every time there's a shortage of money, uh, maintenance will be the first casualty in terms of shifting uh, monies around. And, and the last uh, factor was that uh, the, the, there was an insufficient skill capacity, both within the public, public and the private sector uh, to undertake maintenance. Uh, even now, we, we are not uh, 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 producing sufficient skills through our, our artisan programs, and uh, through our TVET, uh, because that's where we should be uh, putting an effort so that we have uh, more artisans that are being produced. So these were some of the areas that were faced at the time. If we can move to the next slide. So, so in, 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 from, from 20, 2008 to 2011, then Public Works and CIDB agreed to take their names and say, we will then componentize the work that uh, we're supposed to do within NIMS. And there was a, 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 a steering committee and a reference group that started then to look at seven components uh, from NIMS. Uh, then those components were developed into what was then known as uh, the National Immovable Asset Management a framework, which is the NIAM framework, uh, which was then overseen by the steering committee and the reference group, and, and Public Works was then uh, the driver of uh, that uh, steering committee uh, supported by CIDB and uh, National Treasury. Uh, next uh, slide. So in, in terms of uh, what, what the, the alignment then from those uh, seven areas, there was a realization that we need not to move away from the immovable asset management policy, but we need to align with the life cycle asset management guidelines for both national as well as provincial uh, custodians. So, so what has been happening then, you had a number of uh, misalignment on processes, uh, terminology, and then the framework agreed that we will then develop what was known as the NIAM standard. Uh, from the standard, then we were gonna clarify and define terminology and make sure that uh, there's alignment in terms of processes uh, across all entities. So, so, so members of the reference group then uh, uh, develop this particular standard uh, as part of the, the broader asset management framework. Next slide. So, so from the from the 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 the, the framework uh, and the standard, the the focus was that it, in 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 your management of a life cycle asset and the activities, the focus will be what is ring in on the ring there on the operations and maintenance, and within the NIAM framework, then as I've indicated chair and members, there was a development of a standard that formed the basis of uh, the, 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 the maintenance approach. And then we then had to develop what was known as the accounting framework, a monitoring and evaluation protocol, and creating some, a competency framework where we will then focus on the required skills and required competencies 
and then develop planning guidelines. And uh, in this context, uh, planning guidelines included the user asset management plans that are developed by uh, um, uh, custodian, I mean, the, the users and the custodian asset management plan that is developed by, by, the, by the, the custodians. So, so, so this was then uh, what was uh, part of the NIAM framework, but the other element uh, uh, chair and members that was added was the contractor development through the maintenance industry because we realized at the time that we need to focus on making sure that uh, we develop uh, uh, contractors that will focus on maintenance. Uh, that is why now you have in, within the industry some of the players that have uh, developed and, and positioned themselves as uh, uh, maintenance uh, service providers and they are providing total facilities uh, options in terms of uh, the management of uh, the portfolio of uh, maintenance. Next slide. So, so as I've indicated, Chair, um, we, we then uh, published uh, uh, the, 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 the six uh, framework documents, which were hosted by CIDB uh, with, uh, for all the uh, provincial and the national uh, departments to, to, to access, uh, which were defining the standard, uh, the accounting framework, the monitoring and evaluation protocol, uh, the NIAM planning guidelines, the competency framework, and the contractor uh, development uh, uh, within uh, the, the maintenance industry. And, and we are showing uh, in that slide uh, some of these examples of the booklets that were printed and they were distributed to various uh, uh, infrastructure departments, both nationally and provincially, in terms of how they could then utilize. Uh, these uh, these uh, uh, elements of the framework. Next slide. So so as as we were busy uh, uh, with this process of um, the the NIAM framework, National Treasury then in in twenty eighteen uh, 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 adopted what is known as uh, uh, the in twenty sixteen rather what is known as the standard for infrastructure procurement and delivery management system. And within that system, uh, it was uh, 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 direct all infrastructure department were um, uh, directed to follow a particular uh, planning, uh, budgeting, implementation and monitoring framework, including maintenance. Uh, but there was no alignment of the SIT PIM with uh, the, the NIAM framework. This resulted then that in 2018, there was a, a working group of uh, National Treasury, the Department of Public Works, uh, provinces, uh, uh, CIDB, uh, which then uh, led to a consultative process to review the SIT PIM. And then uh, in 2019, uh, National Treasury then uh, uh, gazetted or um, gave a guideline in terms of uh, the instruction note number three of 2019, which then became the framework for infrastructure delivery and procurement management, which then prescribed what will be the minimum requirements for effective governance of infrastructure and procurement management. And in a way, Chairperson and members aligning then the life cycle asset management right from planning to design, uh, to implementation, to maintenance, and then up to, up to the disposal of uh, the particular uh, asset. Next slide. So as I've indicated, what, what then the, the, the feed PIM does, it, it, it then prescribed how the IDMS, um, which was a, 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 a at the time, uh, a, a preferred uh, infrastructure methodology, but what the feed PIM then did, it then made sure that the, the feed, the IDMS is implemented by all 
infrastructure department. And, and within that, there would be a four key delivery processes. First one being uh, the portfolio uh, process management uh, program uh, uh, as the second one, the third one being project management, and the third one being uh, operations and maintenance. And uh, it then created infrastructure procurement gates and delivery gates in terms of who must be uh, delivering a particular gate. And this was uh, to be effective uh, from uh, 1 October uh, 2019. What we then did as uh, the National Department of Public Works and Infrastructure in 2019, we then started developing the standard operating procedures aligned to FIDPIM. Uh, and those uh, standard operating procedures we then shared with the provincial uh, uh, public works and infrastructure through our technical MINMEC. And our MINMEC um, uh, also endorsed uh, and the presentation that uh, of the, the, the standard operating procedures and noting that the mandate is concurrent, we then had to make sure that uh, provinces also uh, align uh, some of their processes with those uh, standard operating procedures. So, so as part of the alignment then, uh, we, we, within the portfolio process, uh, like uh, Mametsi is gonna talk to now, Chair, uh, 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 ISA then as a single entry point of projects, they, they then look at a large scale, high impact and complex projects which are above uh, uh, 1 billion, either projects or programs uh, at a portfolio level. They would then make sure that there's proper feasibility, the projects are bankable as part of the planning. And when the project then is ready for delivery, they then uh, use the five case model at uh, the project management level to then say how the project uh, will be implemented uh, from early business case uh, using the five case model uh, into the bankability of the project. And uh, in the next slide, um, uh, we are showing uh, those uh, uh, processes in the feed PIM to say at portfolio process, this is where we then link the, 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 the planning work that ESA does uh, at a high level, but at the project process stage, uh, when the actual project now is looked at the pre-feasibility and the feasibility, and Mamezi will take the members through, then how the five case model link uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, project management. Uh, I think I can then, uh, in the next slide, uh, hand over to, to uh, I, I've, I've already spoken to this slide in my presentation. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so I, I, with your permission, Chairperson, I will then uh, allow uh, uh, DDG Masimula, as directed by Prof Ramakupa, to then take us through the, 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 the ESA process in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the bankability and the five case model uh, with your permission, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, DDG Gosana. Good morning, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, DM uh, Kivit, um, DG uh, Dr. Muemi, uh, Prof. Ramukopa, Head of Infrastructure South Africa, uh, Honorable Members, and uh, the uh, team from DPWI that are joining us this morning for this presentation. Uh, Chair, I was just putting on my video so you can see that it's not a robot that's speaking behind uh, the microphone, but that is the live person. Um, so for now, I'm going to save the bandwidth and uh, switch it off, and then we can kick off with the presentation. We are starting the presentation on the five case model, um, honorable chair and um, honorable members um, to do a quick recap on what 
the process flow looks like and what are some of these uh, governance structures that are currently in place uh, within Infrastructure South Africa to ensure that we are enhancing uh, the, the, the quality uh, of the project preparation process for this national portfolio of infrastructure investment projects and, and programs, and also adding on the issues around the visibility of the project pipeline, as well as showing the, um, the uh, accountability uh, components to it. So as uh, Prof. Ramokhoba spoke, um, ISA itself is a single point of entry for all infrastructure projects that require direct fiscal support, meaning that uh, direct fiscal allocation, as well as indirect uh, support, in, indirect fiscal support through credit enhancement facilities. Those projects, as per the cabinet directive, must come through the window of ESA so that they are well prepared, they are packaged um, uh, in line with the uh, five case model, uh, which we'll talk to um, in the next slides, because this five case model allows us to conduct very detailed analysis and optioneering exercises based on data, based on the different models that we apply, economic models, et cetera, to come up with uh, projects or business cases that are robust, business cases uh, where that will allow funding and financing decisions uh, to be made uh, for these uh, major infrastructure programs um, of, of, of government. So we do assess as these projects come through from national government departments, provincial government, uh, municipalities, state-owned entities, as well as private sector projects, and they come through the window of ESA. We will look at these projects um, um, applying the lens of your, the national infrastructure plan, uh, for instance, uh, just to ensure that uh, these uh, programs or these projects and, 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 and programs, one, are going to have high impact. They are aligned with the strategic development goals of the country. They also um, help us achieve the targets that are set out in the National Infrastructure Plan, uh, the presidency's uh, country investment strategy, as well as other national sectoral policies. So we use this five case model um, and have designed, uh, we, we have the different stage gates and approval processes to make sure that as mentioned earlier, that we are enhancing the quality of these business cases, uh, working very closely with the project owners and project sponsors, uh, especially those in the public sector. In the case of private sector projects, um, in the main, these projects, uh, uh, the financing component would have been, um, is not an issue. Uh, however, they will require unblocking um, in, in, in terms of government authorizations, uh, approvals that are required to, to enable these projects to be rolled out and, and to be implemented. So that's the type of support that we then provide for private sector um, infrastructure projects. But for, 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 for the public sector ones, um, it, in most cases, the, these projects are not, um, they do not have the funding and therefore we must take them through the, uh, this methodology and the different stage gates of approval to make sure that, or what we call the lines of defense, uh, to make sure that by the time the, uh, the funding uh, decisions and financing decisions are made, that these projects are well prepared and, and packaged. So from a governance perspective, as they come through, if you look in the middle, the, the, the dotted um, uh, 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 blocks, they come through uh, the website of ESA. They are, they, they are then submitted through to the uh, portfolio management office. Uh, there's a team uh, in, in ESA that will look at whether these projects, just at the high level, are they complying with the eligibility uh, or admissions criteria? You know, are they projects uh, uh, over the um, uh, 
uh, 1 billion rent mark, uh, for example, the right sectors and so on and so forth. Once that is done, uh, what that high level uh, assessment to check that they, they comply with the admissions criteria, those projects get to be submitted to the various technical working groups. And here is where that whole of government approach comes through as well as um, ability for us to tap into the expertise of and the skill sets of private sector. Uh, so those technical working groups have a small uh, uh, technical um, experts that sit in those uh, technical working groups. We are supported by line function departments or policy mandate departments. So if it's energy projects, we've got the uh, the DDG or director from DMRE sits there. If it's human settlements, we've got the, the DDG or chief director that from Department of Human Settlements. They look at the at the policy um, uh, lens, the, legisla the legislation uh, lens in relation to those projects. Then you've got the technical teams uh, that do um, from uh, local um, DFIs, uh, uh, IDC were supported by DBSA, uh, the PIC, uh, uh, for example, as well as multilateral development banks such as the World Bank, the European Investment Bank, your African Development Bank, New Development Bank, etc. Sit in those technical working groups, helping with developing these business cases in line with the five case methodology. Once that um, uh, second line of defense has, uh, those projects has gone through that second line of defense, they get to be submitted to the Infrastructure Investment Review Committee. This committee is chaired by the head of ESA, Professor Ramakopa. It also has seats in the, the National Treasury, the Department of uh, um, uh, DPME um, sits there. The uh, uh, two private sector representatives are also sitting there as well as the, the, the DDGs and program managers in, in Infrastructure South Africa. Then these projects get to be submitted to the Infrastructure and Investment Committee that is chaired by Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure. And there again, the DGs of National Treasury, uh, uh, DPE, Public Enterprises, DPME, DTIC, the CEO of uh, SALGA, uh, CEO of MISA also sit, uh, as well as private sector uh, represented, also sit in that, in that, uh, in that uh, committee. Um, and then the approvals are made in relation to these projects. So once they have approved, these projects would have been such that um, the uh, funding decisions are ready to be made. And they will be, it, it typically they'll fall into three buckets or three funding pathways. There will be projects that will be for commercially, that are commercially viable, meaning that although they're private sector, public sector infrastructure projects or programs, they are such that um, they do not require fiscal injection. And so Infrastructure South Africa will work with the project sponsor to go out to the market to raise funding for those projects. And then there'll be um, a second category of those projects that are for blended finance uh, um, or, or PPPs. Uh, and these are projects that will then be handed over to the infrastructure fund. Uh, the infrastructure fund will apply their blended finance mandate and ensure that they are leveraging private sector capital uh, with a small amount of money uh, from the fiscals to help um, uh, uh, fund those projects. And then there'll be those projects that have got no uh, re uh, revenue um, uh, prospects of revenue generation. So those will be projects that we, we categorize them as pure fiscal projects. And those will be the projects that National Treasury will then allocate funding um, uh, to depending on the size of the envelope, et cetera, et cetera. Essentially, they'll all follow a budget process. Um, once the funding has been uh, is made available, procurement has taken place, the asset is being delivered on the ground, Infrastructure South Africa will also assist uh, project sponsors where required with infrastructure uh, delivery, the delivery of that particular infrastructure uh, asset. And also from the ISA Center of Excellence perspective, we do measure uh, the benefits that will accrue from the delivery of that asset. Um, as in now we validate uh, the contribution of that infrastructure investment program uh, in terms of its contribution to GDP, to contribution to spatial inclusivity or spatial transformation, 
job creation, um, etc. So we'll be doing um, uh, pro providing and, and uh, uh, publishing these type of reports um, in the next year or two because it takes a while to deliver these assets. But that benefit realization mechanism is is part of ensuring that the infrastructure pipeline does contribute to strategic national um, uh, or socioeconomic uh, uh, goals of the country. So if we go to the next slide. So the next slide, uh, honorable chair and members, this one speaks to the five case model because we've been asked to uh, update the committee on, on um, the training or around the five case model and what has transpired. Uh, uh, Prof. Ramokhopa, in his introductory remarks, uh, talked about the five case model being internationally be uh, being an international um, best practice in preparing and packaging projects. We've been um, fortunate um, to have received funding through the UK government, uh, coordinated by the British High Commission in the country. Um, to roll out this five piece model to all infrastructure South Africa officials, infrastructure fund um, officials, um, certain um, 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 SOE such as TCTA, Sunral, Transnet, and them, they've all participated in this program, national, other national government departments, as well as provincial and uh, municipal um, government officials that are involved in the infrastructure ecosystem. So all in all, we uh, over um, about 139 officials have been trained on this five case model, as well as um, uh, additional 15 on the uh, uh, project um, uh, development route map. That one, it was more uh, testing um, the application of those principles on a live, on a live uh, project in the country. So there are learnings that uh, have been derived from that um, pilot phase. In the next round of rolling out the five case module in the next financial year, uh, that uh, project development route map PDR is going to be very much part and parcel of the entire five case model as we roll it out uh, uh, even more ensuring that as many officials as possible, both in government, in public entities, SOEs, uh, we start uh, to embed and institutionalize this way of packaging and preparing infrastructure projects such that they are, they are, uh, such that they are of quality, uh, that these projects, they, they drive economic growth, they are able to attract significant private sector participation and investment, as DM has said, and also ensuring that these projects contribute to meeting the goals um, and government strategic objectives uh, overall. So the 5 case model essentially um, uh, is called the 5 case because each the, the business case for each project, infrastructure project or program will have five elements to it. So, so those five elements are the, um, the strategic case. So the strategic case essentially is asking the question, to what extent is this um, a project fit for, for purpose? How does it respond to the policy, to, to policy, to national policies or strategies, uh, what are the objectives of this project, et cetera. So on the economic case, we are asking the question, um, is the project economically and socially desirable? And what is the opportunity to cost? So that's where we conduct, uh, that's where we put a lot of effort from the ESA perspective, the assisting um, project sponsors and owners with conducting a cost benefit um, analysis. So that economic case essentially rests on, on that modeling exercise that we assist um, project sponsors and owners uh, with. And then there's a commercial case um, because it's important that um, before, the, the, before the procurement uh, takes place, um, et cetera, that the, the commercial case is uh, robust, meaning that we can demonstrate very clearly that from a supply side perspective, we're able to deliver on the requirements uh, 
um, and we have a detailed procurement strategy. The uh, proposed contract structure is at, in place. The allocation of risk is done correctly, etc. So that commercial case, as well as the financial case, around the financial case is more around the project um, affordability, and also where is the funding going to come from? So the, the financial case must answer that question. Um, unlike at the moment where uh, uh, what you find is that um, a project owner sponsor uh, will submit a, a, a business case, uh, for instance, to the PPP unit at the National Treasury. But the issue around who's going to fund this, pro this program, infrastructure project or program, is, is not resolved. It's still going to be resolved as, those, as, as it moves through the different um, uh, a TS uh, in relation to that PPP. So from a five piece model perspective, we answer that question upfront. Who, what is that uh, source of funding and support uh, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the for the infrastructure uh, pro project? And then the management case, of course, here we look more on how this project is going to be delivered practically. Does the project owner or sponsor have the requisite capacity, project teams, um, the skill sets essentially to deliver on the project? Um, because sometimes even with uh, 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 SOEs and, and funding that's already allocated for, for projects, projects don't take off uh, sometimes due to the fact that the, the, the project owner or project sponsor does not have the requisite um, capacity to roll out uh, the project. So with the five case model and the work that we do, we're able to demonstrate, assess and validate the capacity of this project sponsor to deliver on that infrastructure project. So if we go to the next slide, the, the next slide here, Chair, Honorable Chair, we attempted to map um, the, the FITPIM and the five case model um, alignment uh, because there are areas where, yes, there are similarities, there are areas where uh, there is um, uh, usage of um, 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 uh, terminology that is um, um, uh, the same. Suffice to say, and again, what um, Didi Gosana referenced when he was presenting is that the, 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 the FITPIM is an end-to-end -end framework for the full life cycle management of an asset. Right? And it assumes that uh, the budget has already been allocated by the National Treasury. Whereas with the five case model, we are developing a business case for projects and programs that do not have a, a funding allocated to them. So we want to be able to make sure that we are using a methodology that will help us to develop a quality and bankable business case for each project. Uh, of course, it also includes the, the, the asset life cycle planning as well. Uh, but with fit, fit, people are logging in information on the system that has been designed by the National Treasury. You know, you say that I'm going to do this, um, uh, build a school, I'm going to build a, um, a, a police station, a post office, um, uh, etc. You log in that information there. From our side, we are helping to prepare the business case uh, to make sure that the, the, projects, uh, the project can raise funding, uh, as mentioned through the fiscals, through blended finance mechanisms or through debt capital markets. So the diagram, uh, how we've uh, um, uh, put it together is that we want to show just the two methodologies that they, they, requ they may require similar um, uh, information and documentation. However, from a five case model perspective, there are additional requirements that must show fit for purpose analysis and more detailed needs analysis, commercial viability, financial case, uh, uh, the, op the different options, et cetera, et cetera. And as it moves through the different stages of approvals or sta stage gates, um, the, the, the governance structures that we spoke to analyzes these uh, 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 different um, uh, uh, five cases within a, a, a business case. And that's where really Infrastructure South Africa comes in and, and we do the heavy lifting on our side 
in terms of supporting project owners and sponsors to develop and provide that detailed analysis, uh, especially on the financial case and the commercial case we find, and the economic case as well. Um, uh, too often, uh, the need for a project um, is clear, you know, so that's the strategic case. They'll say, we do need to build this asset because it will solve X, Y, Z, but then we need to go further than that and develop the, the, the relevant models that will support um, uh, the, the, the funding for these projects. So from where we are sitting and through our own analysis, we believe that complying with the requirements for the five cost model is actually a lot more resource intensive um, and, and it requires analysis of each identified option prior to uh, uh, whatever option that's going to be uh, uh, um, that's going to be approved finally um, and therefore uh, the the it's much more robust and going through this methodology will actually help um, the the project sponsor that was thinking about a PPP for instance uh, um, and those project sponsors that want to submit projects to, to the national treasury for the budget facility for infrastructure to meet those requirements of the national treasury, provided that they've come through the window of ESA and that we have applied the five case model um, as it were. So from a FITPIN perspective, of course, uh, project owners can continue to follow those processes, uh, et cetera. However, for projects, that are registered with ESA that we believe are high impact, they are large scale, uh, the project sponsors um, must agree uh, or agree that we will be applying uh, this five case methodology as a form of a much more heightened level of scrutiny and analysis uh, to ensure that these projects are bankable and are viable um, uh, in, in the long run. So if we go to the next slide. This one um, speaks more on the PPP um, um, uh, uh, um, analysis and, 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 and where we believe um, um, the ESA's uh, five case methodology will add value um, on, on this. So we, of course, the, the, our analysis shows that the, 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 the to register a PPP with National Treasury is not really, um, there's not uh, prescribed information that is required. Um, the, 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 it moves through the different uh, layers, uh, TA1, TA2, um, et cetera. But from, from our side, we are saying that um, the rather than a project owner Is everyone gone? I was just about to ask the same thing, Shay. <laughs> just Nama responded was, to Sam's message. Um, Nama was going to call Ushu Abe. Maybe the challenge is with us that are in Akashia. So we all lost her, ne? We, we all lost her. She's oh. gone. Or maybe we are all lost. Maybe we are all lost, Shay. Uh, we, we are here. We are here. I refuse here. to hear that. <laughs> professor, <laughs> professor, professor, uh, Mokoba, and can, can you check for the lady, please? This is from a compliance perspective, um, ensuring that the unit actually undertakes. Uh, um, Honorable, thank you. Prof. Uh, Ramakopa, can you please check uh, our presenter? In fact, she is even out of the meeting now or maybe ask someone to finish up uh, presenting. 
Can, can you hear me, Che? Yes, we can. I, well, yes, I, I might be having the same problem of uh, connectivity. I was about to write to say that I'm trying to change location myself. Um, I will, I will do the, I will, I will complete the, the presentation myself. Um, okay. So I think, okay. I think what the, the, the we're trying to illustrate here is the, 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 the project life cycles uh, when we use the, the five case, uh, the five case model. Uh, and just to say that we, we've got what we call the five gates of, uh, of interrogation. Um, uh, the first one is what we call the early business case. And really the, 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 the point there is to ensure that the, the project meets the, if you like, the strategic intent uh, uh, consistent with the, with the provision of, uh, of, um, of the N NIP and also the national, uh, the national uh, development plan. But the, the point we are trying to make without necessarily going to the entire um, uh, phases of, uh, of how we assess the project is to just to illustrate, if you like, uh, the key difference uh, between the, uh, the five case model and the, and the, and the triple P uh, 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 model. Is that the, the five case model is, a, is essentially um, a, a robust, uh, a tool for, for, for assessment. Um, uh, like I said, you start with the early business uh, case uh, and then uh, you, 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 you then move to what we call the intermediate business case. And then you get to a stage where honorable chair, you have to assess if you like, how, what are the best options for financing this, uh, this project? Um, and uh, one of those options could be a triple P. One of the options could be uh, to be financed through the, the, the fiscals. The other option could be a, a blended financing mechanism. So the triple P uh, assessment only starts, if you like, uh, at the, what is uh, the third stage of the five case model. So the triple P, um, triple P I'm sorry, um, assessment doesn't ask the strategic question. Is the is a project consistent with the, the national priorities? Uh, is it in the right in the right area? Uh, all it 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 does is to assess, if you like, uh, whether the financing options is uh, consistent with the with the triple P. Um, and we are arguing that uh, you need to first ask the primary question: whether the project before you is the one that uh, meets the the, nas the national strategic uh, strategic goals. So triple P is but one of the uh, the three financing uh, uh, considerations that uh, are available to uh, to finance a project is not the ultimate uh, is not the ultimate uh, uh, financing tool. And then in terms of the five case model, once you get to be financed, whether it's a triple P or you you are you are you are financed through the fiscals or you are it's a blended financing mechanism, we also ask the question much later when the project is delivered whether we have, uh, we have achieved what you call benefit realization. So benefit realization, uh, honorable chair and, uh, and members asked the question, uh, you, you said you wanted to achieve uh, uh, efficiency in the tra public transport network. You said you wanted to reduce the occurrence of fatalities or accidents. You wanted to reduce the, uh, the emissions. So it's important that uh, once the asset is delivered, they uh, post the asset, so it could be three to five years, you go back and ask those questions. Uh, and then there are those questions that are related to the, uh, the actual delivery of uh, the asset, not uh, much later, not the outcomes, but when you deliver the asset, you had promised that you are going to create 5,000 jobs. You had said that you, you'll get the, the local, um, um, you'll you'll not be importing material from other places. You'll get it locally. You had indicated that you are going to source your inputs uh, uh, locally. So we get to ask those questions. But when you do a triple P, it's just a financing solution, and it ends there. Once the the structuring is in place and the asset is delivered, it doesn't ask those questions. So we think that it is important that we you also ask those questions for purposes of. Uh, achieving, if you like, the, the, the national strategic goals that of uh, growth, uh, uh, industrialization, or in our instance, reindustrialization, employment creation and skills. So the, the triple P framework will not ask those questions. It's simply a, a, a financing solution. And then the next slide. Uh, 
can we go to the next slide? Oh, so so really here yeah, is just to to make the point that uh, uh, we 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 acknowledge the work that we we have presented and the and the noting of uh, of that effort. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Chair. Chair, I'm, honorable Chair, I'm, 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 I see that my network. I'm going to go to. We just go just to go to a place where there's better network. It won't take me time, but I'm um, DG uh, Dr. Mwemi is leading us with the team. It will just be five minutes, and I come back okay? just to go to a better place. Otherwise, I'm going to inconvenience the meeting. Thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Ramakhopa. Um, any, oh, the DM spoke earlier on. Uh, I will now invite honorable members uh, to raise their comments and questions on this presentation that we have received. Um, Honorable Graham Murray will be the first one. Honorable Hicklin will be the second one. Uh, according to the hands that are in front of me. On that order, honorable members. Um, thanks very much, Chairperson. I really appreciate it. And thank you very much to, to the Prof and his team. And congratulations, Prof, on being bestowed with your professorship. Um, I have huge respect for people that have attained high levels of education purely because of the work that goes into that and I think it's it's amazing so I'm glad that that somebody like you is heading this um the problem for me is that I don't I'm not a professor um and I, I just feel like that the more information we get on ESA, the less I understand about who you are and what you do um and maybe it's just me and maybe I'm just too dense to work out what is going on but um I have a few questions. I mean, the whole concept sounds fantastic. I think it's fantastic that their case study is being built and I, and I appreciate all of the, the work that's gone into it. My concern is that we're adapting a or adopting a um, an international G20 scenario or um, um, policy or methodology um, that doesn't necessarily speak to the country that we live in and the issues that we face as a country in terms of um, the way projects are managed, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, the, the whole the whole presentation started off with with discussions around maintenance um, and the lack thereof, um, and then obviously built in the whole thing about asset life cycles and and how we should be monitoring and measuring that. And again, um, ESA is only looking at projects that are over a billion rand. I don't think there are masses of those that are lying around, and I'm concerned that. A project over a billion rand that's that's um, that's being presented to ESA might not necessarily be the kind of projects that need this sort of intervention. Um, it's you know it's it's like if you look at if you look at housing, your very poor people benefit from from government housing. Your your wealthier people benefit because they can afford to buy housing. It's that that middle gap market that suffers the most because they. They're, they're neither too poor nor too wealthy to be able to facilitate their own housing strategies or their own um, housing outcomes. So I'm concerned that a billion rand project should have the skills and capabilities were built within the, the, the sort of environment to, to look at case studies, to look at funding models, to look at all the things that you're doing on their behalf, whereas it's your, your middle cost projects that are probably the ones that require that level of intervention to actually get them off the ground and get them functional. Um, but that's just, just my own personal opinion. Um, one of my questions is, is that ESA is a coordinator. So you provide a coordinating function. Under the infrastructure inclusion into the Department of Public Works, ESA currently falls within the Department of, of Public Works. The prof sits on the PRCC. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of interlinkages, etc. DPWI pays the cost of ESA. How does ESA generate income? In other words, you do case models, you do all these studies, you bring in all these brilliant people. I doubt anybody's working for free. I doubt the resources you are using are for free. So who's funding the cost of those? And are we recouping any income as a result? 
or is this just a cost um, factor for, for the department? So is any money being generated anywhere for the, this kind of service that has been provided? And to whom is that money being paid in order to cover the costs that are being incurred in order to do this? Um, and then I agree with... Um, one of the other things we talk a lot about are the UMs and the CMs, and I'm not sure that these are being as effective as they need to be. And I do think that maybe while while ESA is looking at this sort of acid life cycle scenario, that we start looking at a better way of ensuring that maintenance is being done. Um, you know, maintenance is always a let's see scenario in most budgets. It's never an imperative. Um, and my concern again is is that you've got a one billion rand project that comes along or above, what is being done to ensure that there are maintenance um, structures built into that project case study to ensure that particularly where there are public partnerships, public-private partnerships, and there are pure fiscus um, spending, what are we doing to make sure that the money that is invested in that project is then going to um, see value for money going forward because we're going to then ensure that there is proper maintenance being done on those projects. Is anything being done around that in terms of what you are currently busy with? Um, and then um, again, you, you spoke on slide four about the art, artisan skills, um, particularly the FET colleges. They do things like bricklaying and that. But then there's a, there's a battle with implementation. There's a battle with um, projects and construction companies that are not adequately um, upskilling and, and working with those, with those people. I know Kucha Development Agency, as an example, their EPWP workers that they bring on that are being trained and upskilled, like as bricklayers, are so well managed. The department itself is not doing as good a job. But we need to be developing plumbers. We need to be developing engineering skills. We need to be developing draft people. So... Um, I agree that that is something that definitely has to be addressed going forward. Um, then in terms of the um, five-place model, how long does that entire process take? I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an intricate, um, integrated process that requires a lot of um, engagement. Um, just as a sort of, I mean, obviously, I know it, it differs from project to project, but have you set a time frame within which that entire process should take from the conception from the early business case right through until the, um, the funding mechanisms are, are determined? Um, I have spoken about the uh, maintenance. Um, I've spoken about the other projects. Um, oh, and then just finally, you, you draft these um, assessment reports, which is fantastic. Who, who receives those assessment reports? Are they revisited? Are they monitored on an ongoing process? Or does your job stop at developing, um, determining who, the funding model? Um, and then once that's that's done, the case study's been done, the business case has been developed, you hand that over to whomever the implementer is, and that's the end of the process. Um, so is, is ESA's thing just the, the sort of coordination up to funding? Or does ESA then monitor the rest of the project through to, to finalization? Um, and then, um, yeah, and, and then through that process, how would we then ensure that we are monitoring that there is proper value for money um, being achieved for the money that's being spent on these projects? I think that's me. I, I hope I've made sense because um, this is a, a very new concept and it's very confusing how the whole ESA thing um, fits into everything that we're discussing. But thank you very much for the for the um, presentation today. Thank you, Honorable Graham Murray, Honorable Hicklin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have turned my video on. You can see that I'm here. But again, we are challenged with bandwidth um, in Acacia Park. I will leave my... Um, I will leave my video on. If I get challenged, I will switch it off. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the presentation. Prof, congratulations on your professorship. Uh, like Honorable Grammarie, I am always in awe of people with uh, learning of the standard of a professorship. But in saying that, there in comes the rub for me, because you are speaking to lay people like myself who very often don't understand precisely what you're getting to and and there we get a gap and i think as isa as infrastructure south africa you 
need to tailor your presentations so that there isn't a gap for the people who are actually listening to you. We need to make the presentations more people friendly so that the questions that I ask and the questions that other people ask are more easily understood. It's almost as if you have to kind of dumb it down a little bit because I'm, I, I want to ask questions because I don't understand to this very day right now, having sat through this presentation and other presentations about ESA, exactly how, how you are going to invigorate a construction industry that is really on its knees. I think the economy in South Africa is really struggling. And when we start talking about construction projects that you are going to, or ESA is going to invigorate that start at a billion rand, your average construction company is going to shut off completely because they are nowhere near that kind of level. And we have to be able as the Department of Public Works and Infrastructures Portfolio Committee to do oversight over all the funding projects and over all the construction projects. And I think that the language used in the kind of presentation that we got today alienates your average person who is watching this program on YouTube, on Parliament television, and that is not what we need to do. We need to actually make this more, more friendly to your average person in the construction industry who's looking for assistance, who's looking for hope to carry things on, and who's looking for the, the way in which we are going to be able to move forward as a country. We need viable construction projects, and that may not be necessarily ESA's mandate, but you need to offer South African construction companies the hope that that is exactly what ESA will do, because it's infrastructure South Africa. So we need to make it more understandable in what we're doing. But turning actually to ESA in itself, um, how many projects has ESA actually facilitated? How many projects have been registered in terms of ESA South Africa, um, Infrastructure South Africa? How many, how many projects do you have on your books since you came into operation in 2019? Um, how many people have actually worked through your 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 operations and maintenance guidelines um and sorry i just got distracted a message just came through on my phone um and where is the funding for these ppps really going to come from on slide 16, it said that the PPP was not prescribed. So how do construction companies become part of that PPP five case model framework? What guidance, I, 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 I sound confused because I am confused. I am nowhere near as clear as I should be when construction people in the construction industry come to me and say to me how do i work with isa infrastructure south africa i am no clearer on offering them advice than i was at the beginning of this presentation at the end of this presentation and it really is um quite disturbing for me because you have a massive budget from national treasury but it's only for exceptionally large projects dpwi has to become the construction industry economic driver 
DPWI, Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. ESA is a very big part of that. And yet I don't see the invigoration that we should be giving into the economy coming from ESA. And maybe it's because there is such a gap between ESA and, and our understanding of what you do. I'm going to leave it there and hope that you are able to answer some of the questions that I have posed. Um, we need to we need to, to be able to communicate better is basically what I'm saying. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Hicklin, Honorable Tring, followed by Honorable Suiza. That, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I think just because of my unstable network, I'm going to leave my video off if that's okay. Um, Chair, in, in the presentation, so firstly, thank you for, uh, for the presentation and to all those who, who presented. Um, it's, it's appreciated. Um, in the introduction of the presentations, <clears throat> reference was made to um, uh, numerous challenges um, within infrastructure development. Um, two of those being um, challenge with regards to an inadequate uh, immovable asset register, uh, <clears throat> as well as inadequate uh, maintenance. So, so this is this was noted by the by the presenters. So, <clears throat> what then is uh, the involvement with uh, with ESA, the involvement of ESA and 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 the department um, in in this regard? We and I know that in particular, Honorable uh, Hicklin has has made numerous uh, appeals, including myself. Uh, with regards to uh, Department of Public Works, in particular, having a, uh, an, a, a an immovable asset register uh, that one is able to utilize uh, to effectively manage uh, the huge property portfolio that Public work, Works has. So, I want to just interested to know what then is is ESA's involvement? Um, are you going to be Are you going to be assisting uh, the the department in uh, in terms of uh, fast tracking the immovable asset register uh, challenge that, that the department has. And then my second question, Chair, is um, how does ESA see themselves working with um, other infrastructure implementing agents like, uh, like uh, the, the IDT, which has um, thankfully just come back on board and, and, and seems to be really picking up nicely uh, in terms of what they are able to do uh, in terms of infrastructure development and also the mandate that they have uh, within uh, within the department. Uh, so those would be my questions, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Tring. Honorable Suiza. Uh, thank you, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, Chair, my, my, first, my first request is going to be, can we be provided with the Circular 77 of the model SCM? That's, that's the first request I'm going to have because it's going to be very difficult to be able to connect what has been said and then we are referring to a circular that we are not aware of it. Chair, I went through all this presentation. We can have whatever model that we want we can come up with any kind of strategy that is there. My biggest problem with the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure is that there is a lack of consequence management. And I'm asking myself, if this model does not work and somebody is responsible for not allowing this model to work, what interventions are going to be made because there's nowhere where we are speaking about consequence management. I try to go through it. They are talking about the infrastructure, infrastructure South Africa that's going to be responsible for coordination of one plus one billion plus of projects. And yet there is nowhere where they say how they are going to deal because we need to look into project management. They are coordinating one billion rents of a project. And then nowhere in the model are they talking about if, if the project does not go as it's supposed to go, what intervention are they going to do? Because any model or 
any document or any presentation that you make, there needs to be ways of saying, if this happens, this is how we are going to deal with it. And so those are my problems about the model. And I would agree with the other members to say that it's very vague. Uh, it, it, if it was going to be explained in a, in 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 whereby you are explaining to a grade one or a grade two learner so for them to understand as to what is this five five I can't even pronounce the name. What is its work actually? What were the reasons in Lame's language to say? These are the reasons, the reasons, the, the whole thing comes from, this is what we saw, this is what we think must happen. And if it does not happen, this is how we're going to intervene in the whole process. So we have that problem. I have a problem of consequence management. I have a problem that there are no interventions that are being put in place. So ISA is going to go forward with this model and then they are going to coordinate whatever 1 billion rents and money of a project that is out there. And then they are going to wait for if there's a problem and then they'll have to go back to the drawing board and come up to say, these are the problems. Because if the, the, the deputy minister, when she started, she said that it, the, 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 the whole thing is called infrastructure 2050. So, What's going to happen between now and 2050 if, if we, we are going to go with this model? If there's no plans of consequence management and there's no talks about project management because we know some people are going to block projects to happen because as, as Honorable Graham Marie always says, the, the mafias out there blocking projects and because of certain processes were not followed, and people were not involved in certain projects that are going to be done. Some way the projects are going to be stopped and it's going to be a loss of money and then there's going to be a rollover of projects and everything. Those are my only problems for now, Chair, and I'll listen to the responses. Maybe I'll come up with any other follow-up question. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable <clears throat> Suisa. I saw a, the no a message from uh, uh, Honorable Grammar. Uh, Honorable Grammar, please uh, do ask that question. I thought it was going to be a follow up, but do ask that question so that I can also uh, raise my own points. Thank you, Chair. And you had forgotten something that I was supposed to ask. Um, Yes, my question is, is that um, all indicators are that the rebuilding of parliament is going to cost in excess of 1 billion rand. Um, news reports in the last week have indicated that um, National Treasury basically doesn't trust the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure to handle the rebuild. Um, and the indicators are that they are um, looking at giving the money directly to parliament. Um, for the reconstruction process. Given that this falls within the um, financial um, ceiling that, or financial um, area that, that ESA deals with, I just wanted to know whether or not ESA is going to be um, providing a business case and looking at funding models for the rebuild of parliament. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, um, Honorable uh, Graham Mare. Uh, let me also Add my voice, uh, GM uh, from Hopa and the team, in appreciating the presentation that was made to us. Though it was a, a bit of high level, as Honorable Hicklin is saying um, to us, a uh, lay person. Um, just a few questions on my side. Oh, let me appreciate uh, the fact that you are talking about the fact that ISA will assess the value for money achieved through the infrastructure projects. That one, it's, I think it's a green light and uh, it's a beacon of hope in all the challenges that we are facing. Um, my first question, uh, uh, the time, the time for this. Uh, remember one of the reasons we asked 
you to come and present to us is because we are concerned with service. Looking at all the stages that have to be followed, if you talk about the, 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 the five case model, uh, uh, what time are we looking at? Is that, uh, in fact, the, the stages as before you go to the project itself, uh, Prof, uh, are we talking about yes? Are we talking about months? Remember one of the challenges that is facing South Africa is that a project that is supposed to take three months, it takes three years. So now you also have stages before the final um, implementation of the project. So what, what exactly are we talking about? I'm seriously concerned about that. We're saying uh, uh, there must be uh, projects that are done and, and you also gave us the list of projects that you are following. I remember you gave us, though we have not checked how far are you, true, are you with those projects. So the time that we're talking about in the phases, first phase, how many months, how many days? Second phase, um, that, that, is, that is the first, the first question. Um, the, the second question is, um, uh, you have also talked about the, what, FIPDM, Framework for Infrastructure Procurement and Delivery Management. Uh, how is this going to prevent corruption? One of the challenges that we have in fact, the, the issue that our projects uh, don't take the time uh, that they are supposed to do, let's say three months for a road, but it takes three years. It's because of the corruption practices. So this, this framework, how is then going to ensure that uh, we, we prevent corruption and we deliver the services to the people of South Africa? Three. How does this um, uh, framework work? Uh, uh, are all the project managements that, that, that you, you, you have, project uh, managers or project management teams that you have in the directorate uh, will be following um, this? Will they be doing the assessment? Uh, Look now, you are saying you want to do e assessment to check whether um, value for money has been achieved. Um, so, which means before you sign off a payment, these projects are going to be, this, this uh, due diligence will be done. So my question is, are your project management teams aware of this or will they be doing it before they sign off? Uh, maybe a certificate that has come in for a payment. Uh, thank you so much for, for, for this. Uh, lastly, the issue of the triple P. I, I think we all know that uh, it has been raised uh, previously that the regulations for triple P, they need to be amended. Um, so uh, how far are we reviewing the triple P regulations. Thank you. Over to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Apology, uh, apology uh, DM, apology DM, I didn't see the hand of Honorable Fans Calvey. Honorable Fans Calvey, over to you. Sorry, 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 my person. member. Yes, dear. Yeah. May I proceed, please? Yes, please proceed, Honorable Franz Calvey. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and good morning to the Honorable Chairperson, members, and DM, and our support staff. Uh, allow me to, to just greet and then mute my video. Uh, Chairperson, uh, I'm appreciating the, the report that has been presented to us, and I just need to know I'm not going to venture into the areas that's already been raised, but I want to know, Chairperson, uh, what is the uh, effect that ISA, uh, what effect does ISA and this model have that you presented to us have on the first uh, uh, 
instance, and does ISA have a solid enough impact on the social infrastructure projects like your courts, your police stations, et cetera? And can we make the assumption that having ISA inside the departments have an impact on achieving excellence in, for instance, construction project management in the PMTB? Then also, Chairperson, I need to know uh, what ISA is supposed to do with our main concern uh, regarding maintenance of the property portfolio NIMS and for them access to develop and guide the maintenance industry. Can we uh, request the report, Chairperson, also that maps and unpacks the key pillars and components of what is called the maintenance industry? We've also seen, Chair Chairperson, that uh, there is some kind of a review of NIMS underway to ensure proper implementation. So I want to know what is uh, the, the timeline also in terms of this review of, of, of NIMS. Then Chairperson, uh, uh, it, 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 it's a point of concern for me uh, continuously as we know that research indeed confirm that it is more cost effective to provide plant maintenance for an asset instead of waiting for the deterioration of the building and the equipment. And properties which do not comply with legislation, regulation may result in government being faced with uh, litigation by the communities and also uh, uh, the people who's occupying those, those uh, buildings because it may be hazardous and accidents may occur. Can we get an indication therefore of, of uh, what their plans are in terms of ensuring that indeed a plan maintenance is prioritized uh, against uh, uh, the, the, the issue of, 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 of uh, uh, emergency maintenance or unplanned maintenance? Thank you, Chairperson, I foresee. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Fans Kalweik. Let's uh, also acknowledge the presence of Minister uh, Jalil, who has just uh, joined us um, in the meeting. Uh, you are welcome, uh, Minister. Um, over to you. Chair my, uh, Chair, my apologies, Chair. If I, uh, there's just just one or two other questions that I'd I also I, I forgotten. I thought it's the leakers we had. No, no, I've been <laughs> putting it up and so that you would see. You, you are known see. for the leakers we had. Okay, <laughs> let me allow you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, just quickly two, two questions. When I was in council, I raised the issue, for example, of um, the increase in water water demand um, with with the uh, concurrent lack of supply, uh, particularly in South Africa. So would South Africa be known as a water scarce uh, country? Mm -hmm. So the quest, simple question is: um, uh, is is the building of dams, um, uh, desalination plants, and so on in South Africa, noting that we are a water scarce country? Um, is, is that a part of, of ESA's uh, long-term uh, project? Um, and, and similarly, with regards to the, the unbundling of, uh, of ESKIM uh, and the developing of different reticulation infrastructure uh, projects throughout the country, uh, would, would ESA also see themselves, is ESA going to be involved in, in, in that kind of infrastructure development in the country? And then lastly, uh, Chair Treasury, in a, in a previous meeting, um, that I was in with, uh, with Treasury, they raised concerns with regards to budget overruns in many of the projects. Um, and so what systems uh, would ESA uh, see as, as putting in place to ensure that we don't have budget overruns? You know, where a project that is, is 1 billion rand, uh, you know, doesn't become 50 billion. Um, we've seen this in, in the tourism uh, sector out in, in uh, Limpopo, uh, a 6 million project. Uh, is now looking at 50 um, million, uh, 50 million rand. So, um, what systems in place to prevent budget overruns as well with the uh, projects? Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, Honorable Tring. Over to you, um, Minister DM and your team. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, um, Honorable Chairperson. 
and uh, let me also acknowledge minister this time around and um, as 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 a norm uh, honorable members from my side i normally allow all officials to respond to the questions uh, come back uh, after they have responded uh, to deal with those uh, political ones and then um, given that now minister is with us, uh, I will, with your permission, uh, Che, um, also give uh, her the opportunity um, as, as, as the lead and the leader in the department uh, to, be the, to have the, the last say, understanding that she would not have been uh, exposed to the earlier questions and discussions. And, and therefore, allow me to give over first to Dr. Muemi, and uh, of course, with a, with a, a prof, if he has been able to join us, he will be after Dr. Muemi. Um, given that most of the questions uh, relate to the linkages, uh, as I listen to the nature and the scope of questions from the honorable members to say, what, what would be um, the linkages in terms of what uh, NIMS provide uh, together with uh, the linkages with the five um, case uh, methodology. So I would, uh, I would uh, ask um, Dr. Muemi and then um, if, if, if Prof has joined us, he would be next. Uh, and if not, and then I will allow uh, Mamitsi to, 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 to respond to those uh, technical ones and Kosana, and then I will come back to round the political ones and then uh, hand over to Minister. Uh, with your permission, I, I'm proposing that approach, uh, Honorable Chair. Dr. Moemi. Uh, thank you very much, uh, DM, and uh, good morning to the Honorable Minister. Chairperson, uh, with your permission, I would request that uh, in order to have a better bandwidth, uh, that I do not switch on the camera. Uh, there is load shedding here, and it's a challenge to, to keep up. Uh, let me acknowledge the chair as well as the members of the committee and uh, welcome the questions that have been put forth uh, to the team uh, in terms of uh, the concerns that have been raised. Maybe the first real start would be to start where we should have started uh, with uh, the question raised by Honorable Franz Galvig as to what exactly is the problem we're trying to solve with this model. <clears throat> now, the true measure of any project management uh, success is whether a project is uh, achievable and uh, the desired uh, results and outcomes that were set in advance are actually achieved, but even more important, that they are achieved on time and that they are achieved within budget. Uh, with these two measures uh, being uh, the two measures that are, are glaringly lacking uh, in the South African construction landscape, particularly within the public sector. And therefore, correctly, as uh, members have pointed out, uh, this is one of the maladies of the system we are trying to address with the, the five case uh, model that we are seeking to roll out and to implement across large scale uh, construction project and infrastructure projects within uh, the government uh, pipeline. Of import as well is that uh, previously we have had a number of projects that have been uh, in stream, but as you may know, many of them have remained uh, incomplete and they have not necessarily 
gone to their logical conclusion. And part of the systemic failures uh, are around issues related to planning and even uh, more or less uh, the unanticipated uh, delays and uh, rise in costs, which then become prohibitive and make sure that the projects come to a screeching halt and that they are not uh, caught. With the five case model, we seek to respond to that by introducing a number of gateways uh, for project approval processes and for conceptualization of projects. And uh, we have also been asked, uh, what then does uh, ESA add as value uh, to all of these uh, maladies and to what we are saying? The truth be told is that the capacity of the state to harness and to bring the necessary synergies across the different role players uh, within the public sector, whether be they the entities uh, that do large scale programs, whether be the sector departments, whether be the regulatory entities, uh, whether be the different spheres of government with different uh, authorities and uh, different uh, uh, power to authorize uh, planning, development, infrastructure rollout, et cetera that those uh, be at province or even at local uh, government, that a credible pipeline of projects that are bankable has not necessarily been realized uh, by the state since 1994 until uh, we have uh, the infrastructure mandate uh, clarified and until ether has been brought into being with the possibility of it driving and harnessing that and bringing all those synergies together. So all the ingredients for a successful program exist at different spheres and exist at different uh, authorities as well as entities. And indeed the kitchen is available to uh, cook a nice stew for this, but what we have not been having is a proper chef. And I think with that analogy, Isa comes uh, with his skill sets as a chef to look at all the ingredients that are here, to look at what to put in first and at what stage. And uh, with it, it comes armed uh, with the recipe. And that recipe is the five case model, which uh, looks at uh, what to do first, at what stage, and with different stages, uh, thereby bringing along a credible pipeline of these projects and subjecting all of these projects uh, that have been to pre-feasibility study, bringing them through this model to test them, to stress test them, to ensure that by the time we invest significant amounts of money, number one, that these projects have been prepared uh, thoroughly to a stage of bankability. And therefore project preparation is one of the important value adds that has been a missing piece in the puzzle of uh, uh, infrastructure rollout in our republic uh, that ESA brings to the fore and to the party. And ESA harnesses all of the skill sets as well as expertise, including those from the private sector in bringing together into stream uh, uh, project preparation and into bringing together that the projects reach the area of bankability so that at any time, uh, whoever is the project sponsor uh, takes the application to say, for instance, of the National Treasury through the budget facility for infrastructure, that we are almost semi-guaranteed that that project would pass and that it will receive funding. And it does not end there. ESA then has to monitor all of that. We have been asked whether it simply just does the studies and then shelve them, not necessarily. When those studies have been done and the credibility of the project has been brought beyond doubt and that that project has been brought to bankability and financing has been provided as such, therein lies uh, the follow-up work ESA has got to undertake. And in doing so, ESA does its work by uh, uh, working with project sponsors, providing them with the necessary and requisite capacity and supporting the project sponsors to bring the projects into fruition, uh, into the construction phase, 
and in this case, ESA also provides a, a support and mobilizes expertise to support the project sponsors in various other, as you may have seen the framework, uh, it also provides for large scale procurement for complex projects, and it seeks to bridge the gap that has been existing now. And this gap, we have been paying for it heavily uh, with uh, project delays and project penalties. And if the model is implemented to the latter, and ESA does what is uh, required to do in terms of this model, then we would see better procurement, better conditions of uh, contracting, and therefore better uh, outcomes in terms of project management of ensuring that the contractors do deliver uh, according to the two measurements of a successful, successfully managed project being the delivery of uh, the intended project within time and within budget. So, so that's the big value add and the bridge that ESA brings to the party. ESA was never designed to be a project implementer itself. However, we are hearing what uh, Honorable Graham Marais raises, and we can uh, assure Gr Honorable Graham Marais that there are new uh, green shoots that we are seeing in this regard. And we have, for the first time, allocated to ESA uh, the ROT program as well as SIP28, where ESA now plays a role of a catalyst and importantly, as an implementing agent on behalf of the department. This is the first time uh, since the establishment uh, of ESA that we are also uh, pushing them towards that mandate and to also fill a vacuum that uh, is identified uh, within the PMTE and the challenge of capacity within the PMTE. And indeed, uh, the questions raised by Honorable Van Skalvik as to whether we would see a better improvement in this regard. Yes, gradually as it rolls out and uh, as its uh, impact uh, happens, we would uh, more and more uh, strengthen the implementation mandate. And uh, to that extent, uh, we would see more and more of some of the major projects the PMT must drive uh, being supported by ESA in this regard, while the PMT restructuring uh, takes root uh, as a permanent solution. Now, I must say that uh, the interface uh, of ESA and ESA accountability, uh, clearly it has been uh, proclaimed and gazetted as part of the National Macro Organization of Government, that ESA with its infrastructure mandate belongs to the Department of Public Works. That's where its primary funding for administration comes from. And that's where they are accountable to, to the Minister of uh, uh, Responsible for Infrastructure, being Minister Dilil. And uh, accordingly, they also prepare for the Ministerial uh, uh, Infrastructure Development Committee, which sits regularly and sits uh, to consider the gazetted pipeline of uh, strategic infrastructure projects and ESA is supposed to act uh, as a key player in presenting reports uh, of its own monitoring, the extent of where these projects are right across the entire public sector system. And even better, uh, ESA is also attached as a secretariat now to the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Committee, where Minister Delil is expected to lead and to present reports to the president and to uh, colleagues in within cabinet to check the progress uh, of the commitments made on the infrastructure pipeline and to look at its implementation in the overall. So therein lies uh, hand in glove, the role of ESA as a uh, coordinator, uh, the chef as I've indicated, and what uh, it then does. So uh, is the system perfect? No, we do not have a readily made template. We have uh, been uh, looking at different options, but we have now uh, feeling comfort that we should adopt the five case model. We are adopting a model uh, as Honorable Graham Marais says is a foreign model, but yes, but we see that it is a proven model, that it is a model that has been stress tested under different conditions and not just in the developed world, but where uh, the British government has supported, even in the developing world, countries to successfully implement and roll out this model. We do believe that uh, 
with customization here and there. And indeed, there has been discussions and workshops to customize it to our local situation, considering our uh, edifice of our loss, and to also look at uh, the practicality of implementation, considering our capacity constraints across the different spheres, and particularly with the project sponsors. And you would see that in some gateways, we're making amends for that to bring in the requisite capacity to support as part of uh, at those stages of uh, the five case model. So therefore, we, we do believe that uh, we can customize the model to our situation and to suit what we are doing and to have the requisite impact in this regard. Uh, I, I will pause there, DM. I will leave the rest of the questions to Nkosana and Manesi to, to deal with. Uh, and uh, we can then hand back over to the DM and the minister. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, DG. Okay. Can I go on, um, DG Kosana? Proceed, proceed, uh, DG Masimula. All right. Thanks, thanks, DG, um, and thanks, honorable um, chair and, and honorable members. Um, so I will touch on some of the questions um, uh, on that have been asked um, because DG has covered. Um, uh, quite a significant number of those. So Honorable um, Grandmare is asking the question why um, we deal with um, projects that are of one billion rand and above uh, for now. Um, and and is because from where we are sitting, um, Honorable Member, is that to, to be able to close the current infrastructure investment gap, right? So the gap between the infrastructure that's required now and that which will require by 2030 or 2050 and looking at the fiscal envelope. So the, the, the budget allocations that the, may possibly be made by the National Treasury, which we know every year it's shrinking. That infrastructure investment gap to close that and be able to meet the targets that have been set in the National Development Plan insofar as infrastructure is concerned. We need to bring to the market 16 to 20 major projects the size of uh, by port development, uh, the dams, the Lesotho Highland uh, Highlands scheme, water scheme, uh, phase two. You know, these are projects uh, of 10 to 14 billion rand every single year, just in addition to the normal ones of building schools and ensuring that there is other social infrastructure that is, uh, being, is being rolled out. But every single year, that's what we need to be bringing in, um, into market uh, as part, again, of reviving and rebuilding uh, the construction industry. So, so we must be able to utilize the resources that we have at the moment to really close that infrastructure investment gap as much as we possibly can and to invest, as DG says, in the preparation and packaging of these uh, major infrastructure projects um, or programs, because again, it can be maybe the schools that we'll be looking at in the Eastern Cape and Northern Cape as pilot phases. Uh, collectively, it's more than 4,000 schools that would, are required to be built um, in the next coming years um, to address the, you know, the backlogs in, in schools infrastructure delivery. So these are massive infrastructure programs of, of government and we need to be bringing those into the market, 16 to 20 of those every single year. And the question is asked again around who pays for these costs because uh, ISA um, is a program of the DPWI and uh, there is a lot of technical support, significant um, amount of technical support that's, pro that's been provided to project owners and sponsors, the heavy lifting that we've spoken to. And uh, no, at the moment, uh, we do not charge a fee. So the resources that we have um, and the budget uh, 
the 148 million rand budget that we have each year, and that includes for both goods and services as well as um, cost of employment. That's the budget we have. Uh, hence, we are working very closely with multilateral development banks, your uh, development finance institutions, private sector uh, um, um, uh, professionals that are seconded to ESA, uh, paid for by the private sector to work with ESA um, in developing these business cases. Uh, so for now, we do not charge a fee. Uh, and not at all uh, is the resources that we, we have at the moment to help uh, uh, progress the, and graduate these uh, infrastructure projects or the business cases such that funding decisions are made. Um, how long does it take for the, in terms of the five case model? Uh, what are the time frames, et cetera? And the answer is it depends. It depends on the sector. It depends on the complexity of the project. It depends on the, 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 the size of the project from a project value uh, perspective. So the requirement on our side is that when the project gets to be registered with ESA, we will work with the project owner and deliver on the early business case. So the early business case is both the scoping exercises as well as conclusion of the pre-feasibility uh, reports that must be done within six months or less. So that is the requirement. And then when we move into the bankability phase and moving into financial close, and that's where all of these things are dependent on the complexity, the size, the sector, and so on and so forth of these projects, because that's where we do the, the actual financial structuring of these projects such that uh, when they get to the National Treasury for fiscal funding, you know, they are well prepared and packaged or they are handed over to the infrastructure fund. The infrastructure fund can immediately go into market uh, with those projects and leverage private sector financing, etc. So the bankability phase and financial close, that's the intermediate business case uh, phase of this project. That can take anything between six uh, to 12 months to conclude or less depending, as I said, on these other variables. Um, however, we work very hard and we work very closely with the project owners uh, to make sure that we really apply maximum effort and uh, bring in the skill sets that are required to progress those projects uh, or uh, progress the business cases as, as it were. Dr. Hubert Joint is here, he's the um, program manager and the head of the Infrastructure South Africa Center of Excellence. I think he's going to be talking more on the issues around uh, infrastructure delivery, value for money, assessments, benefit realization, and all of that. So he will speak to that. On uh, Honorable Hickling, um, we 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 take note and we take counsel and uh, and the, and the guidance that's provided around uh, making the presentations um, to be perhaps less technically focused and more readable and understandable um, so that uh, even a person that's not sitting in this meeting and uh, goes through it uh, can understand it better. I think we, we take uh, guidance uh, in terms of that and we will do better in, in relation to the other uh, presentations that may be coming through um, to the portfolio committee. There is... Um, Something there's a um, the infrastructure and projects authority in the UK. So we had a knowledge exchange program uh, with them about three weeks ago. There is a quite a, um, a very nice uh, uh, document that they publish every year, and it's called the construction pipeline. Um, so that report is forward looking. What does it, what it does is they, they, they uh, publish all the infrastructure projects and programs uh, where funding decisions have been made and procurement uh, will be taking place um, in that particular financial year and they publish that. We found that it's maybe quite a very useful tool of um, engaging directly with you know, construction companies, the construction industry, and helping them to gear themselves up 
to taking advantage of these projects that will be going online, uh, uh, coming onto the market, uh, and there'll be, you know, procurement events taking place and so on, and it details, uh, you know, the timelines, etc. We found that it's something quite useful, and we're working internally. Um, and we'll be, you know, um, uh, engaging with uh, several stakeholders internally in the department, uh, including CIDB and so on, to work on perhaps uh, having such a, a, a report uh, that's, uh, you know, um, uh, that will signal to the market that this is the construction pipeline. So not a project pipeline, but the construction pipeline. So those projects that are coming online and coming on stream on a, on a, on an annual basis, we found that from a, from the UK government perspective, uh, that can be something that can be very useful um, as part of engaging the construction sector and reinvigorating uh, the sector as it were. We will provide uh, the information that has been asked around um, uh, the projects. How many projects have we facilitated? How many are registered? Um, et cetera, I think we'll just, because it's quite, uh, um, uh, quite a, a long list, uh, we'll provide that information and structure it such that it shows you the, where the projects are, the ge geographic location, the size of the project, the stage of this project, et cetera, and then provide that information to, 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 to the committee. Um, and then uh, the other issues raised by Honorable Maxim Thring is on the, whether um, projects, the desalination projects, uh, the water um, infrastructure projects, the energy projects uh, are part of the pipeline of ISA and the answer is yes. Um, actually, there are uh, two projects in the Eastern Cape on desalination and they, are, they form part of the ISA project pipeline. We work um, the uh, pipeline uh, development team um, they have standing uh, project steering committee meetings with ESCOM uh, in particular. Uh, every second week, uh, those meetings take place to look at the ESCOM pipeline as it comes through. And we're beginning to see now uh, the fruits of that particular setup, uh, a, a significant number of um, energy projects from ESCOM itself uh, being registered with, with, with ESA. Uh, so yes, we do we do deal with the energy ESCOM projects as well as the water infrastructure projects um, in totality. They, are, they they form part of the ISA pipeline, and that information will also be made available to uh, members um, uh, if it's yeah because we yeah it's been required. We'll make sure that uh, that gets to be submitted through to 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 the committee. And I hand over now to Dr. J, uh, Dr. Joint, uh, on the assessment issues and related aspects. Thanks. Um, thank you, DGG. Um, good morning, uh, Chair, um, Minister, DM, and, and members. Um, yes, uh, thanks for, for the questions. I think very pertinent questions, very relevant. Just in terms of the technical evaluation, um, you know, uh, we, we also need to ensure that uh, the standard for evaluation, but also for project submissions is at the appropriate level. And I'm just going to put it into uh, numbers why this stringent uh, evaluation and detailed evaluation is required. If you look at the current underspending of allocated public sector infrastructure um, funds, uh, we sit between 42 billion to, to about 90 billion rand per annum uh, of unspent infrastructure funding. Now that tells you uh, quite a number of things that the proper management case was not in place to deliver the project. That's why we have a five cases. It includes the management case, which focuses on delivery and monitoring of projects, but it also tells you that probably the proper project has, uh, uh, the wrong project has been finalized because they have not done all the different business cases to ensure smooth delivery of a project. So, so we need to reverse that situation because if you look at it, uh, you know, the uh, public sector uh, infrastructure, uh, 
uh, funding allocation is around 200 to 250 billion per year. And if you underspend by 42 billion or up to 80, 90 billion, it's a significant portion of allocated money that's not being spent on project delivery. So um, at the Center of Excellence, we also acquired specific macroeconomic models and, uh, and apologies, uh, members, I'm going into a bit of detail because I think it's important uh, to ensure that, you know, the standard, but also the, the uh, appropriate uh, economic information is used. So we, we have specific macro models for the different provinces. The problem is uh, what's happened in the past is uh, many of the submissions make use of a national model and then the national model is not always uh, relevant to a specific province. For instance, a rural pro province like Limpopo, Eastern Cape, the, the economic uh, multipliers differ from the national uh, model. So, so that's why we, we differentiated and disaggregated into having specific purpose-built uh, provincial models to ensure that there's improved accuracy. We've also, together with National Treasury, standardized specific uh, inputs into the project evaluation. For instance, I'm, I'm again going to a bit of detail, your discount rate that impacts your uh, net present values and your returns on a project. Uh, in the past, there were no standard. Now it's, uh, you know, standardized at 10%. So at least when you get different projects from, you know, from water, transport, at least all of them use the same discount rate. So you can then also now compare intersectoral projects. Now, my team has also assisted you know, this year we supported 10 different uh, project sponsors to do the cost benefit studies um, and also to do uh, the macroeconomic studies for, for submissions into uh, the budget facility for infrastructure to ensure that we start helping those um, organizations uh, that do not always have the technical know how. Um, and yes, uh, uh, we have also assisted on a specific desalination plant. So again, I would just like to re-emphasize that, you know, uh, in terms of a national infrastructure plan, water, energy, freight, transport, and ICT are the main, main focal areas. Although the next phase focuses on, on distributed and, and municipal infrastructure, but it's very important to take note of that. Um, I also just want to respond to the question on terms of the recovery in terms of the construction sector. Um, my colleagues at Public Works, uh, they can give more detail, but uh, the, the construction industry recovery plan is currently being formulated. Is us providing inputs to that. So there's already a plan in action to ensure the recovery of a construction sector. Um, and then, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I, I think we, I've covered, uh, I just want to go back to the importance of a management case. Uh, uh, may, uh, uh, Honorable Sir Wiesa also referred to the issue of a lack of consequence management. And, and the good thing about the management case, it's purpose built around the project. So it includes risk management. It includes processes to deal with non-delivery. So the issue of consequence management can definitely be built into the management case to ensure that delivery takes place the way it should be, take place. Um, I think that's about it from my side, uh, Chair. I'm going to hand over to uh, my colleague at uh, DPWI to... Uh, Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> th thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Joint. And uh, um, also let me recognize uh, the presence of the Minister. Uh, Honorable Chair, um, with regard to some of the questions raised with regard to maintenance, um, I can indicate uh, to the committee that uh, 
in, in, in alignment with uh, the, the NIMS and the NIAM framework, uh, DDG Lombard uh, in the facilities management branch has started the process of uh, reviewing our own maintenance policy and strategy. Uh, and uh, we, we are, have been supported by ministry in this regard and, and, and very soon, will be finalizing on that approach. Uh, we can then share uh, the report at a later stage uh, with the committee. But, but key to, the, to the, um, the strategy is around ensuring that uh, within our maintenance budget, 70% uh, up to 80% of our budget uh, is uh, geared towards a preventative maintenance and uh, anything from 20 to 30 percent uh, will be focusing on reactive maintenance. And, 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 and this is what uh, the DDG Lombard and, and his team are currently are doing. And, and, and what we have done as part of aligning uh, IDMS and the standard operating procedures, we have uh, already finalized a draft circular, which uh, the implementation will be 1 April 2023. Uh, that circular aligns the feed PIM, the processes that uh, we have uh, 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 spoken to earlier. But what, what we are also considering as uh, what Dr. Joint has indicated and what uh, Prof. and Mamis said, there is a need to also put our own project managers uh, through this particular training of the five case models because as part of the project planning and the feasibility, there's a need on the management case to have a proper uh, uh, um, and anchoring a project towards making sure that the basics of planning uh, uh, and the requisite skill set is infused within that uh, management case. So, so that is a work uh, in, 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 in progress uh, uh, members. Uh, I, I want also to, uh, on the point that uh, Honorable Graham raised, uh, as part of the, the new standard operating procedures, we, we are working with the planning unit to review our user asset management plans and the custodian asset management plan so that they just don't become a compliance document, but are documents that are intended to be used for planning and, and for budgeting purposes. And, and we, we are at an advanced stage in ensuring that even our user departments, they don't just submit uh, the UM uh, for, 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 for compliance, but they, they, they submit proper uh, research and proper uh, 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 captured UM, which uh, is meaningful and that will add value. And uh, uh, what, what we have also done uh, uh, is, is to ensure that, uh, and, and we can bring uh, to, to members a report on some of the artisans that we have put through our pipeline projects uh, and uh, some of the engineers we have now uh, have developed an in-house engineering capacity on some of the infrastructure projects. So we can uh, maybe, also provide a report uh, to, to the committee in terms of the, our artisan program, as well as our engineering capability that we have started to make sure that uh, uh, we have uh, uh, our own timber in, in, in this instance. So, so I, I just wanted to add on those uh, issues. So, so the, the capacity of our project managers uh, uh, to be able also to utilize this uh, five case model uh, is something that we are also considering. And uh, we will provide the Honorable Suisa the secular that uh, you had requested for. Um, what uh, Honorable Tring raised, and, and as part of uh, what Didichi uh, Masimula uh, and Prof reported, as part of your risk mitigation on the management case, you, you, you need to make sure that you mitigate against a budget overruns. So, so and, and they will, that will be linked to consequence management was if, if, if all the issues upfront 
have been finalized and, and are great to in terms of the deliver, deliverables. It's important that project managers then in line with contract management, they know the consequences of a project overrun. And, and this is something that will be infused uh, as part of the, of the, of the training. The, the one part uh, uh, that uh, Honorable Van uh, Skagweg uh, raised um, and, and which minister is also championing is the area of social facilitation. After the approval of the framework by cabinet, we have uh, uh, worked with ISA and the technical advisory panels to develop uh, templates and tools uh, which will be rolled out uh, throughout the infrastructure uh, spheres of government. We have since uh, presented that to our technical minimap. Uh, there's a work stream that is finalizing all the inputs from the provinces. Uh, we are uh, within the next month or two, we'll be circulating uh, those uh, social facilitation uh, templates because they, they make sure that from the planning, communities uh, take ownership of the projects right from planning. And we have linked uh, this uh, social facilitation with the district development model uh, so that uh, we talk of the one plan per district or local municipality. So, so our social facilitation framework uh, will also be rolled out uh, uh, very soon. Uh, minister is championing and piloting uh, elements of that social facilitation through the Salvacorp a project where we are building uh, headquarters of uh, uh, five departments as part of the present development. So, so these are some of the initiatives that uh, I've enhanced and, and are harnessing the strategies towards making sure that we align uh, all these uh, 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 um, uh, challenges and, and uh, implementing the interventions that are, are required. I think uh, uh, DG has covered the, the the number of the of the areas that uh, members raise and and uh, like DDG Masemula uh, raised, we we take note that uh, the the presentation should be less technical uh, for the audience and even for the public, and we we take advice in that regard. Uh, thanks, uh, Honorable Chair and uh, DG and DM. I'll, I'll hand over back to you. Uh, thank you, thank you, TDG uh, Kosana, and and uh, thanks from thanks to D, D, to acting DG and his team. Uh, uh, I think we we have um, covered. They have managed to cover a lot of our um, uh, the, the the questions from uh, our the, the members of our committee. And, and therefore, mine is more to, to round up. Um, I, there's one question I will leave for, for Minister, which has not been uh, um, covered. But my, my general comments uh, and my uh, input to the, the responses already offered with respect to the a first question about uh, about us adopting a, J a G20 approved um, uh, methodology uh, when our problems are in in the manner they are. I, I, I think we we must also contextualize properly uh, our environment because most of this the analytic high range of skills. Uh, we, we don't have as a country, and um, uh, that is that has contributed to us finding ourselves in the quagmire uh, in in the in the in the infrastructure space, um, where projects are not finished on time, overruns, and all that, and and that has its own genesis, which we tend to shy away from and we tend to turn a blind eye on um, uh, that when we talk uh, with our councils about skills development, about transformation uh, in the industry, those are the essence of uh, the skills that we need. 
And for us, we, we can't behave as if we still live in the, in the enclosed South Africa. We live in the South Africa, which is part of the globe. And therefore we must be able to move with the rest of the people of the globe. Because if we don't do so, we, we will run the risk of remaining on the lowest levels of development in the country. And for me, what ISA is doing, uh, taking a number of our um, people, our personnel to be trained for managing this program, talks to further skills development. And it talks to us ensuring that those skills that we do not have, we, we build. It talks to us building our own timber. Yes, we may be utilizing um, uh, the, 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 the seeds of other countries, but the essence is that we need to have those skills and we need to up our game so as to be able to compete um, in, in our own um, human capital. We, we must be able to produce these people that are able to comp compete uh, internationally. So uh, I, I would, uh, I would um, make the plea to honorable members to say, probably that's one program we must uh, ensure we support uh, this training of our own um, people um, training in the five a case uh, a program. So for me, we, 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 it's something we need. Um, but also um, we, we, with ISA, maybe one way to simplify uh, the, comp the, 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 the kind of confusion that members have referred to. Let us look at ISA as our own, as governments, um, what would have called uh, the consultants, the high, the high end range of consultants that would be analyzing and, um, and, and therefore um, that would uh, be innovative in, in their approach uh, in looking and analyzing uh, projects that come through to ensure uh, they are, they are um, success opportunities. And, and therefore, for me, let's simply simplify ISA as internal consultants in government so that um, we understand, we are able to understand their role because their role is more to guide, to advise, to, um, to, to assist, to support um, various uh, project sponsors uh, of government to, to be able to, to ensure that those projects they are planning uh, and execution is in line with uh, international standards. Uh, we are able to, 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 to also compete uh, at that level. And therefore they would bring, they are bringing into government the high end skills um, that are necessary for huge uh, projects that uh, impact the economy, impact the social standing uh, of, of, of our country. And, and therefore those would be my uh, comments, uh, Honorable Chair, to say, let, let's look at, at this, uh, let's try and simplify it in, in that fashion. But I do take the, the, the note and the comment maybe we also must uh, do uh, this, to, must ensure that uh, the, 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 what we bring to honorable members is that which they can easily relate to and which they can easily uh, understand. And uh, uh, I, I take that note as well. We probably need 
uh, as as uh, now those who oversee to 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 ensure that uh, uh, the the what we produce for Parliament uh, is that which is produced for uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Public out today. Um, I, as I have said, the one of Parliament, I will leave to Minister. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. It's, it's now upward delegation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Honorable DM and uh, Acting DG for holding the fort. And thank you to the chairperson for excusing me to attend the cabinet committee. I had to present uh, the IDT uh, business case today. So thank you very much for that. Um, I did not see uh, the comments from National Treasury with reference to the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. But what I can comment on honorable chairperson is that on the 9th of September, when we presented uh, the phase two uh, plan from Kuka Development to the Joint uh, Finance Monitoring Committee of Parliament, it was agreed in that committee that a troika be established consisting of um, a technical troika, consisting of the Secretary to Parliament, uh, and, and then also representatives from National Treasury and from uh, DPWI. What is still outstanding is that uh, that technical committee must report back to the Joint Finance Management Committee, and then we will get guidance um, uh, from uh, the, the, the Joint Committee as to the way forward. For now, as far as I know, officially, uh, that is the position. And as the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure, we will hear the views of the uh, members of parliament. Uh, after all, we have agreed that parliament will finally make the final decision. And I just want to put it on record. I think it's completely, if it's true, those comments, uh, and I would like to see them if Honorable Gremere can um, provide that to me, uh, but it's uncalled for to cast aspersions on DPWI. Yes, there are many things wrong, make no mistake, but I think uh, that uh, we need to deal with these things within the structures of government um, which is uh, in Parliament, where Parliament has summoned us all together. So I will certainly follow that up, but uh, we will wait for uh, the speaker to convene this meeting so that the technical troika can report back to Parliament. I thank you, Honourable Chairperson and Honourable Members. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, GM, and, and uh, all the members of your team in uh, uh, responding to comments and questions that have been raised by the members. Um, we will still engage, even if it's true, uh, return questions, if there are any issues that we feel that uh, um, they are related to the topic of today and would like further uh, explanations on them. But we really appreciate that he, the, the, there is a plan. Um, as I indicated earlier, our ultimate goal uh, as the portfolio committee is to ensure that services are delivered to the people of South Africa. And the reality is that we have a serious backlog of, of infrastructure development in our country. All the best in your quest in, in, in seeking in finances uh, to ensure that those projects are, are delivered. And, and the, the, the model as it is presented to us, it is promising, but we will see when it is happening. Honorable members, um, we are supposed to deal with minutes, but the, for the fact that we still have to travel um, to the city of Cape Town, 
uh, using buzz and all that, uh, I will defer the minutes to our next meeting so that we all go and ensure that we prepare uh, for the sitting this afternoon. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Minister and your team. Thank you, Honorable Members. The meeting is adjourned. Thank Long you, live chair. the chair. Thanks, Chair.